intro to disability studies. I was so excited to see it was um, offered at all because I had really never heard anybody talk about disability. And, and so I was like really excited to take it. Doran Dorfman was the one who taught the class at the time. He was a um, law lecturer, maybe. Even as I was reading the first readings, they were really sort of identifying what disability is and talking about like the social model, the medical model. I was like, oh no, this is me. Like uh, this is my entire experience and the experience of many people I know. It gave name to a lot of the like struggle that I had where it often felt like this is a you problem, right? Like you're sick, you're not showing up to work. And my feeling was always, I'm out here trying my absolute hardest. I keep running up against these barriers for a variety of reasons and to just to have a name for that was incredibly meaningful. And, you know, by the end of that quarter, I was like, I have to get involved in disability advocacy. I have to do this. So some of the, the courses that I developed, the, the most prominent one is the rhetoric of disability. And this is my fifth year teaching that course. It is my favorite course to teach for, for a lot of reasons, primarily one because it's the one that's nearest and dearest to my heart in my research but also because I think it's of absolute critical importance to give students the opportunity to learn about disability as a freshman. And I also developed a Power 2 course. That course actually evolved out of something that I began to notice, which is when we look at students or communication, we, we say you need to make eye contact. You need to not gesture too much. You need to stand in place. And I was like, these are really ableist terms and these are really ableist criteria. Why do we have to subscribe to those? Like what happens if we explode that and or even flip that? So it really is an invitation for students to explore different forms of oral communication that are non-normative. The Graduate School of Education decided that they wanted to have an initiative on learning differences and the faculty were part of making that decision. And then they decided to put together a team of faculty members who would pick the most important programs in the country that were doing special ed. They came to Kansas and they, they, you know, they met our faculty, they met me. The faculty team that came to Kansas told our dean here at Stanford that he should offer me a job. And so he did. And I told him no. I kept saying, I said, no, no. Well, okay, if I'm not going to get rid of you, what if I, what if we did this? What we wanted to do was to try and build on purpose a shop that had people from really diverse intellectual traditions come together to make our learning differences work truly interdisciplinary and create uh, research projects that demand from all of us learning about each other's disciplines, looking for researchers that were on the cutting edge of their discipline, but wanted to contribute to forging something totally new about learning differences. One of our faculty members is building a rapid assessment system that kids can take on handheld technology devices to assess how they understand literacy. It, it can happen fast. The data can go immediately to the teacher and the teacher can implement interventions, figuring out how to capture data that helps teachers actually change their practice in flight so that they can make the best choices every day mm -hmm. for the kids that they've got in their classroom. That's really important. The second thing is that Bruce McCandless and his team are doing some really important work looking at what parts of the brain light up when different kinds of stimuli are presented to kids. But I'm imagining that I'm working in the classroom and on the walls when I'm working with, you know, Jason and Matt and, and Jeremy, I can see when their brains are lighting up and I can make choices in real time about how I'm going to reorder what I'm doing so that I can optimize what they're doing. And I want them to be able to know what's going on too, so they can make choices about how they want to interact with things simultaneously. All of that's just very exciting about what we can do with human potential there. And I can't wait to, you know, get to get to work every day. While Stanford as a university was growing in disability community and visibility, Stanford Medicine was doing this 
lot of the prominence of Dr. Poulos's work and founding the SMATI group and the Docs with Disabilities Initiative. The medical school had started to really think about like, okay, well, we have Carly as our designated disability advisor, but she doesn't work for us. There was this sort of like a, a very real need for dedicated expertise. They launched this new role that was only in the School of Medicine and it's dedicated expertise to students in the MD and MSPA programs, students who have clerkship components of their educational programs. And so we launched in November of 2023 and I, I did just that. I started shadowing in clinic and understanding what clerkships are like and what are the specific technical skills of becoming a doctor and what does it mean to then go into residency and training. So I'm going to be presenting at a national conference and introducing uh, the idea of disability inclusion as integral to a learning community model, which means that we are looking at medical education from start to finish and as a community of learners. So going from preclinical coursework to practicum to transitioning to clerkship to entering residency training and how there is access and inclusion throughout every phase. And, and so I, I am really excited to introduce this new work that I'm doing um, at the national level in September. We have sort of integrated across the institution. So a group that has relationships with the adult hospital, the children's hospital, the school of medicine, and the university. I got an email saying that the president wanted to meet with me. I thought I was in trouble because I go around, you know, talking about how messed up things are. <laughs> and I thought he was going to give me a cease and desist. My favorite part of my job is giving good news to people. He said, and there's good news. You've been awarded this um, medal in recognition of that, that work and not to toot my own horn. I received the president's award for excellence in diversity. I was like, wow, that's awesome. So, I mean, I have to qualify it by saying it's definitely a team effort. Like it's ironic that I'm getting this award for criticizing the university for the last five years. And then on the captioning side of things, we actually are working with a, com a new company. It's called the Kyle Dwork Company. And interestingly enough, he is an alum of Stanford and reached out to our office because he his business coordinates interpreters mostly on the East Coast for East Coast schools and was surprised that we weren't providing in-person captioning just as sort of a universal design best practice and said, hey, I'd really like to help support this becoming sort of standard. With his help, um, all of the big five events that have the president and provost or anything related to the president and provost at that larger scale, we just go ahead and provide captioning uh, for those events. So my dissertation topic is focused on joy-based design for deaf and disabled folks. I think there are uh, many reasons why joy is very evocative to center in disability design in particular, right? Who do we think is capable of joy and worthy of joy? A lot of the conversation around um, access somewhat understandably is very, what feels like pragmatic. For example, why we see a lot of money being poured into like screen readers and hearing aids and wheelchair ramps and things like that, right? Things that like, quote unquote, enable, quote unquote, non-productive bodies, quote unquote, to be productive. And not as much focus is given to, to joy, recreation, to art, to these things, right? Obviously, people with disabilities have been finding and making joy and making art and doing all of these incredible things for the longest time. But it's something that the, the canon in academia is very slow to recognize, right? It's very clear the sort of political power of joy, right? And who gets to experience joy. And then on the other hand, right, it is, it is joyful. It is really fun to be, to be doing this stuff. 